Welcome to Craft Beer Store, a podcast dedicated to educating the masses across the planet on what real beer is. Hey guys, this is Mike, Craft uh, Beer Storm. I'm also the founder and owner and brewer at Barra Brewing Company in glorious Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, today we have an extra special podcast. We're going to the motherland. We're going to Ireland. And we are um, interviewing the owner of uh, Lagren Malt, which is the, the malt that we use for... Um, you know, all our beer, it's the base of all our beer and it's delicious. And, uh, I sent them an email and they agreed to come on. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so, uh, here we go. Hey, yes. Uh, it's Mike here with, uh, uh James Lagren and, uh, Kava Nugent of Lagren Malt. How are you guys doing? Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Very good. Good. So, uh, I'm glad you, uh, you were able to get on the uh, podcast with us. If, if you don't know, we use uh, lager and malt. Actually, it's the base of all our beer. Uh, it's the Irish uh, barley, uh, which uh, makes our beer great, I think, and other people say it as well. But, uh, you know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, I sent them an email. I said, hey, you want to come on the podcast? And they said, yeah, sure. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So uh, I appreciate you being here today. No, it's our pleasure. So listen, uh, maybe you can get started with your story, how you got started. I know it's a family business, um, you know, where, where you get the barley from um, in Ireland, and, and I'll let you go with that. Yeah, well, um, I'm, a, I'm a sixth generation barley grower, and we're based on a, on a family farm about an hour north of Dublin on the east coast of Ireland. And... Uh, just as farming has evolved over the last number of decades, or certainly in the last 10 or 15 years since I've been involved in it, it's become very difficult to grow uh, barley profitably when you're selling it to, uh, into the mainstream markets or for animal feed or, 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 or other sectors. So we were trying to find a way of adding value to what we do and, and trying to find a way of making our farm more sustainable because the idea is to try and build a property which is um, passed on to the next generation in better condition. I got it. To do that, we need to, we need to behave both economically and, and environmentally sustainable. And poor profit and, and low returns for many years meant that not only was it not economically sustainable, but environmentally we, were, we weren't able to reinvest in our, our soils. We weren't able to take care of the of, uh, of, of the nature around us. So we said about trying to find out an alternative way of adding value to our grain, make the farm itself more sustainable. Now, and, do, um, do, you, do, you, do you make all, all the barley you sell is made on your farm, or do you get it from other farms? Or Well, that was how it started off. We started off just growing it ourselves on our own farm, but, but as it's grown and developed, we've, we've asked some of our local neighbors to help us out and, and grow a little as well for us. Just try and uh, spread the workload out across the season and make it a bit more, um, yeah, just make the workload. Yeah, so that, that we, we, we get some of the local neighbors to grow some and, and help out at, at harvest planting time just to share the, share the workload out. But, um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of the genesis of how we began. We wanted to try and add, find a way of adding value to barley and, and, and cereals that we produce on the farm and just make the farm that bit more, um, that bit more sustainable. So that was it. That was what made us look into other sectors, and um, yeah, we just kind of went from there. Yeah, so that's the whole thing with the local, uh, which we, what we're focusing in on. I mean, we're we're based in New Hampshire, but we're using your barley, which is lo- locally grown, and you're use, you're asking your neighbors to to grow it as well. So it's a hyper local thing, but um, you know, we're we're using your barley, and and it's it, you know the beer's coming out great. Um, how many pounds a year or kilograms a year do you guys harvest or, or sell? Do you have that idea? Yeah, malt, uh, we do about, um, we normally take in about 3,000 tons, which would be about uh, 3,000 kilos or six, about six and a half million pounds. Wow. 
Wow, wow, that's a lot of bar- that's about a lot of barley. And do you? Uh, yeah. Can be. Yeah, I mean we don't we don't use. I mean you know we have a small brewery, but um, you know so we'll use like we'll get three hundred pounds at a time per batch. Uh, you know we we use it in all our beer. We use your pale pale malt. Maybe you, now do you do you roast there as well? No, we do not. Do oh, do you outsource that? How does that work? Yeah, so we um we take care of the growing and uh, post harvest we take care of the uh, maturation, the cleaning, the, the drying, and the storage of the grain. Uh, the malting we get done off site, and then we bring it back home for for packing and, and final distribution. Um, and in terms of roasted barley's or or um, barley's which have been processed differently. Um, we distribute in in Ireland we distribute other brands to fill that niche. We don't actually supply um, a roast barley of our own just yet. Um, although we're hoping to change that next year or so. But, but yeah, that's how we that's how we fill those product niches at the moment. Yeah, because yeah, I'm looking on your website here and you have the, the stout malt, you have pale ale malt, um, which is what we use. Uh, the lager yeah. malt, um, you know, IPA malt. Um, I'm not sure. Do you, uh, maybe you can explain a little bit more about um, also whiskey uh, malt. I guess you supply uh, uh, barley to uh, like Jameson or other whisk distillers. Yeah, that's right. More the the, the smaller um, micro distillers, craft distillers. So um, Irish whiskey is going through a bit of a renaissance at the moment, and um, there's a large number of, of smaller craft uh, distilleries being, being opened here in Ireland. We just felt that um, those distillers less in, in a green which was more boutique than the, the more general mainstream malt which, which some of the other dis- larger distilleries um, used. And um, you mentioned as well there, I think a moment ago about our, our IPA malt. Right. We um we um we listened to brewers who were producing, especially kind of in your part of the world, like New England IPAs and post IPAs, where people wanted a, a a beer which was quite hop forward, um, and they really wanted those hops to shine. A lot of brewers did not want um, much by way of malt flavor coming through, but they still wanted the malt to deliver the body and to deliver the, the depth of flavor, which is important also. So that led us to introduce the, the IPA malt, which, which fits that bill. Um, its flavor is quite mild, which allows your hops to shine, but it does deliver a pretty robust body and, uh, and mouthfeel. So it means that when you produce an IPA malt, um, you really can get those fruity, floral flavors, um, which aren't over uh, shined out or, 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 or overlooked by by some some of the more biscuity or malty notes. So that means that brewers like you guys can get those um, those double IPAs and top forward beers to, to work the way you want it to work. Right, and that that's the importance of malt and and hops. It's a balancing game, you know. You don't want to be to be too bitter, but you also want the malt to be to to give it the body, and also, um, yeah, balance the hops and and those balance each other. But the IPA, IPAs, and and you know, in general, and also you know, recently they want the hops to shine, like you're saying. So it's important to have a good malt, um, you know, behind that. But I see, you know, when I when I visit Ireland, also there. Everybody's getting on the IPA bandwagon there. Is, is that what you see? Definitely, yeah. It's been um, IPA has been the kind of been like the craft beer um, trademark. So we've seen very little swing in in consumer preference for um, craft reds or craft lager, or craft stout. Most of those. Uh, niches are still held quite robustly by the by the large macro brewers, but the IPA market has been where the uh, craft brewers managed to 
carbide and pretty robust cells. Right. And produce a product that people enjoy experiment. Tasting. Yeah. Because there's so many different types of hops, and uh, yeah, I see, I see it when I go there. And I thought, you know, we we um, we did a collaboration actually with uh, a brew pub in Cork City, and we called it Survivor. I called it an Irish Pale Ale, you know, to try to we called it a Mid Atlantic, uh, uh, you know, Mid Atlantic Irish Pale Ale. And I thought it was being clever. And then I went to Ireland, and there's like so many Irish Pale Ales there. Like everybody calls it an Irish pale ale. I'm like, I guess I'm not the only one. So yeah. there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of them there. There's there, there's sure a reason, mm-hmm. and there's some some really good ones as well. Um, oh yeah, it, it's probably did that with Rising Suns, was it? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I have I've lost touch with them. I got to reconnect with them. Maybe do an anniversary or something like that. But I tell you that that everybody loves that beer, um, the Survivor we made. And, um, you know, sometimes we take it a step further and we'll like we infused, uh, you know, buffalo wing sauce into it cool. just, as, just as an experiment. And people love that stuff. They love the heat. I don't know. Maybe it's an yeah. American thing. I don't know if they do that there, but I like to experiment with stuff. Um, yeah, no, the, the heat, the heat flavors are not really as popular here as they are with, with you guys. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I mean, I, there's not, and I'm trying to educate people. There's not just IPAs and lagers. There, there are stouts and darker yeah. beers, which, which we like. And, uh, we, we make our, uh, a stout. I like Murphy stout. Um, uh, you know, they're based in Cork, but I, I like Murphy stout and I, I try to, uh, use them as a, uh, um, you know, model for our beer and we make a stout and actually our stout is, uh, the number one seller in our tap room. You know, and and we really? we started, yeah, we started canning it now too. Everybody's into cans here. I don't know how the how it is there, yeah. but um, sixteen ounce cans are the way to go if you want to sell product. We used to sell the twenty two ounce bombers, which are awesome, but the stores don't want them anymore. They want these sixteen ounce four packs. Uh, so you know, everybody's like, you know, looking at the IPA. I'm like, well, let's try the stout. It's a very good stout. So we put it into cans and, um, you know, during the colder months, it sells very well, uh, in stores, but in, in the summer, you know, when it gets a little bit warmer, people gravitate towards the IPAs or, you know, wheat beers, uh, and lock, but, but I, I think stouts are great year round, you know, and then I have people come in and they, you know, in the tap room, they, they buy the stout, you know, they'll, they'll ask for a stout. I'm yeah. Like, That's great. Do you, you put that on uh, on nitro, or is it just uh, I, like no? I got to get organized. I ha- I don't have nitro yet, but I I know uh, uh, some bars and restaurants have put it on nitro. It's delicious, you know. Uh, but uh, we just use the CO two in a tap room. But people people like it. You know, they buy bottles and so it's, okay. so it's a good thing. You know, we make a also make a darker beer. We make a porter, and we infuse some locally. Uh, um, you know, brewed coffee, like we'll make 200 gallons of, of porter, we'll uh, infuse uh, five gallons of cold brewed coffee, and then we'll do 20 pounds of Oreos, Oreo double stuff cookies. Okay. And that was an experiment, and that went nuts. So we can that as well, and we get that into stores. Uh, we call it cake. But it is a darker beer, so we're getting people to drink darker beer, which is a good thing, I think. And and you get the, that Oreo flavor coming through in the beer. Oh yeah, yeah. People love it. Sometimes in the tap room, we uh, we get ice cream like vanilla ice cream, and yeah. we just put a scoop of ice cream on it. And now they have a beer float. We get, we give them a spoon, and they're happy. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to spend a, spend an afternoon. But you know, yeah, it's been. <laughs> But uh, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with beer. It's not just you know traditional styles. You just have to experiment with stuff. And um, but your your barley really provides a great uh, base. And I'm glad that um, I'm glad that we uh, could communicate. Uh, you know, connect. Um, and what do you think about you know other local ingredients? Have you seen uh, brewers adding local ingredients in their beers? Or you know, I think there's the value of 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 supporting local businesses. I mean, what what are your views on that? I think that's the way craft beer is, is moving. Probably not quite as strongly here yet, but certainly in the States, it's become hyper-local. 
um, extraordinarily local. Here, not so much. Uh, guys are still trying to um, uh, make sure they understand their customers' wants and needs before they go too crazy uh, experimenting with, with unusual, or not unusual, less than typical flavors. That being said, there are some really interesting uh, beers out there which have got um, maybe some local fruits in it, some, especially, especially some of the sours. We're seeing a lot of sours coming through using a lot of locally grown fruits. And we right. um, seen some other breweries use some heathers and, and wildflowers and, and other botanicals like that there. Beer. And that they've been there's definitely been um an element of experimentation. But um yeah, the consumer demand is just not there yet for too much of that experimentation. Consumers are still very um uh they're still finding their way in terms of what they want, what they what they like and breweries have to respond to that rather than Right, you have to know what your customer wants, but it's been in, ingrained, I guess, the traditional styles for such a long time that the craft beer uh, industry—it's just, yeah, like you said, it's it's uh, it's it's not as far along as it is, I guess, in the U.S. But I do see it every time I go there. I see more and more craft beer and more more and more breweries popping up, and you know, I like yeah. to go visit them and and see what they're doing. Um, also, the distilleries there. Um, yeah. Like um, the West Cork uh, distilleries, they make the whiskey and and barrels. Um, and I yeah, saw that in the store here. I saw it in here in New Hampshire. So I'm I'm like, you know, all right. Well, you know, we have the cork thing going on. And then I go into the store, and I'm like, West Cork, uh, like whiskey. I'm like, what? Where is this? Where is this thing? So I went online, and I I I, I contacted the owner. And when I went there, it was like last year. I, I stopped by, and he gave me a tour, and you know, I'm trying to get one of his barrels from him. I keep I keep emailing him. If you know him, tell him to send me one of those oak barrels. Yeah, yeah. we actually did um, a kind of a collaboration with um, Castle Island Brewery in uh, in Massachusetts last year. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those guys. Oh, Castle, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they got some they got some um, old casks from um, from West Cork. And then they did up a, a beer. I think it was a stout actually using using our base malt and um, aged it in the in the cask. I, I think it worked out pretty well. They were they were quite happy with it. Yeah, it, I, it was a great part of that. Yeah, he mentioned somebody in Massachusetts. I don't know who it was, but I'd like to get some of those. Uh, if if you do send them again, you know, just carve one out for me and. Uh, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I mean, we don't like we, right now. We have like a Jim Beam barrel um, that we got, and we're we're aging our uh, strong ale in it, and we're gonna actually we're gonna carbonate it this week, and we'll get it out there. But um, those barrels are delicious, you know. The just the beer takes on all the oak and the bourbon flavor, and it's really good. So I'd love to get get my hands on one. Um, you get some really interesting flavors coming through there. Oh yeah. Um, and what do you, what do you, you see the local craft brewers and you see the larger, uh, breweries, um, you know, what, what are some of the challenges you, you, you see of, of craft beer, um, today? I mean, you know, in Ireland. Um, I mean, I'd say the biggest challenge that the micro breweries would probably be facing is the, the prominent position that the mainstream breweries would hold in the bars and um, making it tougher for the publicans to choose the feature and um, some of the micro breweries um, and then on top of that you have the macro or the mainstream breweries kind of creating their own version of craft style beers which can make it even harder for the um, micro ones to the micro breweries to the tap space in the pub in the pub um, i mean just recently in Ireland, we've just had the legislation passed where breweries can have tap rooms based on site, which will allow them. I obviously use of the use can do it over in states, and I think it's applicable to the UK as well. Mm-hmm. 
So I think that'll be a big game changer for a lot of the micro breweries over here being able to sell and their own product on site. Um, and also that there's, there's no middleman to kind of deal with. Well, um, no. well I, that'll be the biggest challenge that they'll be facing. Can breweries have a tap room there? I think I think some of them can. Or it's it's just past. Um, I'd say in the last four to six weeks. Yeah. Um, up until that point, they weren't allowed to sell any beer on site. Oh and wow! And even the leg- the legislation that's just passed, it's not. Yeah, it's not an active day. I think it will probably kick off maybe in six months. Six months, yeah. Um, but I mean. Up until that point, obviously, they were just kind of fighting for it's such a small market, it's such a small domestic market over here. Everyone's kind of fighting for the, you know, the main city like Dublin and Cork. And, you know, there's not that many consumers. So there's definitely, they're definitely going through a period where uh, probably an unstable period, I would say, um, in a flooded market. Um, but, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how the tap rooms help out the smaller guys over here. And, they're not competing against the mainstream brewers and yeah. the tactics that they will impose the pubs. I'm not sure. Do, does every brewery need a distributor, or can they self-distribute? You know, or like, yeah, they can self-distribute. There's no um, there's no legal obligation like you guys have with the the three tier system that doesn't exist. So um, you can self-distribute if you want, but it's a pretty expensive way of getting beer. Um, it's fine for your immediate local uh, area, but if you want to need to travel, um, it's a pretty expensive way of, of distributing. Yeah, Especially it depends. If, it depends how far you want to go or how many or how much beer you can make, you know, uh, depends on the system as well. But um, we, we do self, we're allowed to self distribute here. I've had distributors in the past in New Hampshire and, and they've worked out okay. Uh, but um, you know, now we self-distribute, so we, we do it locally. We try to do it locally, uh, which is good. But I, I, I know I know the challenge, you know, when, when, you know, customers are ingrained in what they want to drink, and that's one of the one of the reasons why I started the podcast as well, because I keep going into restaurants and bars and also stores, and I see like 90% of the offerings, you know, over, or over 90% are this, this large, you know, mass-produced beer. Um, and a lot of people don't, you know, realize that there's good local craft beer, uh, you know, and, and, and I think if they, they got enlightened to that, they'd support their local breweries, um, which I think in Germany, like every town has a brewery, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you know, so I think we're trending back that way, you know, prohibition happened and it was, it was like that in the U S too. It was like 3000 breweries in the U S and then prohibition came and just knocked all of them out. And then some larger uh, breweries uh, started up, and there was just a handful of them, you know, across the U.S. And but now in the last ten years, there's just been a big resurgence of the, the local craft beer scene, uh, which I think is going to be, you know, the the norm going forward. I don't I don't see, you know, a lot of people say about a bubble, and uh, what do you think about that in terms of craft the craft beer scene, and um, you know, you think it's a bubble or is it here to stay? I think um, you'd be, while I'd be more familiar with the Irish market, it's probably it might be a little bit easier to predict the U.S. market. The Irish market is a little unpredictable because it's still so young and new, so it's like craft is three and a half, four percent of the market, um, and it's been struggling over the last year or so to grow beyond that as the um, larger um, macro beer company there are some dominance over the retailers mm-hmm. so until these bathroom legislation activists are able to to use it to their advantage um, and until we see how that goes it'll be very difficult to predict the of these but but the laws are changing it's going to take a while you know um but but I I see more and more craft beer breweries uh, popping up in Ireland, and it's just a matter of getting the word out that uh, they do exist and and that, you know have people try their beer instead of going for the probably, standard. I think I think probably in the states you've seen it already just this movement towards hyper local with smaller 
tap room, smaller facilities, smaller production facilities, librarians, probably the larger guys, the regional, bigger guys who are going to struggle to, to grow much more because ultimately there's only so many feet of, of retail space and shelves and, and kind of hard to, to, to occupy much more of it by somebody on the the water. So be, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd rather be in the smaller end. I think, and then you can pivot too. I've seen a lot of larger breweries here, um, you know, especially regional breweries. You know, they they wanted to conquer the U.S. They went across the U.S. I mean, you know, breweries are really good beer, and but they, you know, maybe they're based in California, but they wanted to be all over the U.S. And then, you know, recently we've seen a big change in in what consumers want. They want local stuff, and and a lot of these breweries are like, all right, where is this brewery located? California? All right, I don't know, whatever. I'd rather have my local uh, breweries beer. Uh, so there's a big shift towards uh, local. Even the regional guys are getting um, hammered too because they're so big. You know, they they have all this equipment. They they just you know rely on brewing fifty thousand barrels a year, and then you know the small guys erode that share, and then and then they're like, all right, what are we going to do? A lot of them, sometimes a, lot, a couple of them got taken over by the banks because they just couldn't support the debt. They went nuts yeah. and they, they they went huge, and uh, you know made good beer, but um, it's just the consumer doesn't want you know uh, some beer from some random location. They want local beer, and I see that trend here. It's just a lot of low, and it's great being smaller too. You can pivot. You know, uh, if something's not working, you, you figure out another way. Um, you know, we we've we we're, we're small. We're very small. But um, we we can pivot, you know. If if something's not working, if a distributor's not working, all right, fine. Thank you, distributor. We're going to self distribute now. Okay, the state's good with that. Um, you know, create create uh, some some um, you know interesting beers on tap. Put it out there. People come in. Uh, you know, if there's a if there's a shift in trends, you know, say people like sours. You know, for the next couple of months, okay, well, let's make a sour. Uh, if they trend towards the, the double IPAs, like everybody wants a double IPA, you know, and uh, here. So um, that's what we did. We made two double IPAs, you know, and, and, and those are selling like crazy. Like we can't make enough, but you just have to, but a larger brewery doing that, you know, maybe they might have their own grain styles and brands and, the, and they can't really pivot that way. Yeah. So, so I think the, um, yeah, it's, it's more trending, more local. So, um, yeah, well, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I saw the You guys are north of Ireland. You're, you're close to Northern Ireland, I think, right? Yeah, we're very close to the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. We're just about six miles south of the, of the border. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting place to be. There's a lot of history and mythology associated with the region. It's just that it's a really nice place to farm. I must come visit. I have to come visit when I'm I'm there next. Hey. I will let you know. That'd be awesome. Um, when do you hope to be over the side again? I I don't know. I'll let you know. <laughs> probably not well, this year. Probably next. Uh, probably next year. But you never know. I might call you up and say, "Hey, I'm coming," because they got cheap flights now. They're actually, we're we're New Hampshire and Rhode Island. They have these these really cheap flights. Uh, Norwegian Air, like Norwegian Air, yeah. is like this random. Yeah. They got like ninety nine each way, so you never know. I might come. I might come there for a long weekend, and I'll, I'll let you know. We'll fly into Dublin, and uh, we'll come up. I'll bring you some of my beer. Yeah, and, that'd uh, be terrific. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, I I appreciate you being on. How can people uh, contact you guys if they want to, you know, learn more about your grain and what's the best way? Yeah, we're, we're on. You know, we've got obviously got. Facebook page, Twitter, or Instagram, and if you that is fine, or you can just shoot us an email to um, sales at malt.ie, and uh, we'll pick it up from there and follow up on any. Yeah, that's great that you got that. Uh, you got that uh, that website, malt.ie. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, um, pretty pretty lucky to get such a good uh, <laughs> main name. Why not? Yeah. So, all right. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. I appreciate your, your barley. It's delicious. Uh, everybody is really raving about the beer. Um, 
and uh you know it, it's attributable to that base that we have and and uh you know keep on doing what you're doing it's uh, you're, you're producing an excellent product and uh i hope i hope we can meet in person uh soon no oh, thank you so much for using the barley and using the grain it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to customers and let you guys know a little bit more about what we do here and um i'm just thrilled when people take something that we produce and um and then make it even better and, and, and add, add their own personal touch to it so yeah thank you for the support for the business hopefully we get to meet each other soon and have a beer absolutely okay well thank you very much again take You're care welcome. take care Bye-bye. bye bye Hey, that was uh, uh, James Lagren and uh, Kava Nugent of uh, Lagren Malt, and they're making some really good barley. Uh, they're growing really good barley out there. Uh, really great soil, and uh, you know the 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 nature of uh, you know the location that they're at. It, it just produces excellent uh, barley, and and it's showing in our beer. Um, you know, and they they. They also su- supply uh, w- distillers in in Ireland as well, and uh, it's just it's just a great barley. So if you're a home brewer and you want to try check it out, do that. Um, or if you want to come in and uh, have some of our beer, please do that. Um, we're located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Barra Brewing Company. But uh, if you like this uh, podcast, and uh, you know, give us a review, uh, give us a rating on iTunes. Uh, we're also on Stitcher. Uh, you know that that. Uh, that'd be greatly appreciated that that goes a long way to getting us uh, out there and and better rated um and and preaching the gospel of uh there is an alternative to mass produced watered down brew and that's a uh, great local craft beer so get out there and get some okay guys we'll see you next week